Oh, hello everyone. Are you all ready for Christmas? Good. I am so glad to hear it. Oh, and me? Oh, yes. Even at my age, I always look forward to celebrating Mass on Christ's birthday. That's how it got the name, you know. Christ's Mass or Christmas. But according to the high street shops, Christmas isn't about celebrating the birth of a child or anything like that. It's all about the antics of a bearded old bloke dressed in a red suit and magically delivering nice presents to good little boys and girls. But lumps of coal to those children who've been naughty. <laughs> so have you been good or naughty this past year? Me? Or oh, I've been good, honest. <laughs> Besides, I imagine the idea of getting a lump of coal would not sit well with the climate activists these days. I mean, hasn't coal become public enemy number one to the climate change crowd? <laughs> but I'm old enough to remember my history, and coal was the foundation of the Industrial Revolution. A revolution that produced prosperity for millions of ordinary people and founded what is today's middle class. I imagine that most of you would be part of the middle class today, although when I was growing up, we were definitely working class. My dad, you see, he worked as a coal miner in one of the local pits that we used to have in this area of South Yorkshire. And far from being despised, coal was essential to life as it powered electrical generators providing our homes with light. Coal also provided necessary heat in our homes against the cold and the chill of winter. And coal also heated the oven in our kitchen, and which mum would bake mouth-watering bread and other tasty delights for Christmas dinner. And you know what? We all managed to survive our coal-heated fires. As for the bearded old bloke in a red suit, all I knew of him as a youngster came from the presents found under the tree. But you know what? He actually is based on the very real person of Saint Nicholas, who was a 4th century Greek bishop of Myra in Lycia, which is now in modern-day Turkey. He famously wore red robes while giving gifts to the poor. His reputation evolved among the pious, as was common for early Christian saints, and his legendary habit of secret gift giving gave rise to the traditional image we have today. It was the Dutch use of his name, Sinterklaas, that has provided us with the present name of Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, that we call now. In England, we call him Father Christmas. In Italy, he's known as Papa Natale, the priest of Christmas. This is me, back in 1985. <laughs> so even yours truly has played the part of such a grand and famous figure. Hmm. <laughs> now, what you may not know is that because of his help to the poor, St. Nicholas is also the patron saint of pawnbrokers. The pawnbroker's insignia of three golden balls represent the three purses of gold he is said to have given secretly to a poor man who could not afford dowries for his three daughters. But no one remembers any of this anymore, so the reason for Christmas has changed entirely. To paraphrase Dave Ramsey, Christmas today is all about buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> 
But Christmas is not the only thing that has changed, has it? To be honest, the world we live in has also changed. Here in England, Christmas shoppers are constantly reminded that the world is no longer a safe place when you see signs everywhere giving instructions on what to do when spotting a suspicious bag or package. Our market squares and shopping areas are ringed with steel bollards to prevent a murderous vehicle attack on unsuspecting shoppers. And almost hidden among the colourful shops and flashing fairy lights are patrolling police officers clad in body armour and carrying very real submachine guns. A very sharp reminder that shopping for Christmas could actually be dangerous. You know, we were all told that in order to ensure our security, we would have to give up some of our freedoms. They actually said that. So what happened? Well, the freedoms of speech and expression were the first to go. Now, instead of wishing someone a happy Christmas, we are supposed to say happy holidays in, in order to avoid upsetting anybody. Nativity scenes in public areas used to be very common, but now they are banned in case someone is triggered and is offended by such a display. And all the fairy lights festooning the buildings in the shopping areas have to be neutral and without any religious connection at all, so no one could possibly get offended. And even Christmas cards must have nothing to do with the birth of Christ, but it is okay to put snow scenes on them, or birds, or even the bearded old bloke in a red suit, because those are safe to send without fear of giving offence. Even our traditional Christmas snacks have to be inoffensive. Really? Hmm. Well, Christmas is all about the birth of a boy named Jesus from a woman named Mary. So, you know, get over it. Get over it. This is supposed to be a season of joy and peace. But when you look at the faces of the shoppers, I don't see much evidence of that as they frantically search for one last item they might need or grab one more bottle of milk just in case. Like many of you, for some time now I've felt a darkness gathering around the world as peace in our world seems less certain and more fragile. The lockdowns imposed over the past few years have shaken people. They really have. Using fear as a weapon, the political elites around the world were suddenly able to impose virtual house arrest on entire populations. And as a result, our freedom of movement and assembly suddenly disappeared as travel was restricted and punitive measures were imposed. And you know they made very little sense. Imagine, you could attend a sports event, but not a church service. You could buy groceries at a local shop, but not attend the funeral of a parent. I was not allowed to celebrate public mass, but I was allowed to be part of a peaceful political protest. So that's what I did. I held peaceful political protests right here at the house. The fact that they looked an awful lot like mass was purely coincidental, your honor. <laughs> but it is true that fear is a major driving force in the world of today. Just as it was at the time of Jesus's birth in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. You know, at the time of his birth, the Fear spreading across the world came from the brutal Roman military occupation forces. The authority of Rome was absolute over most of the known world at the time, and any resistance to that authority was violently crushed. 
travel was limited and religious gatherings were restricted even then. Roman soldiers patrolled everywhere and they had absolute power of life and death over the population. Defy this authority and a slow, painful death on a cross awaited you. The Holy Land had been occupied by many armies over the centuries, and the Romans were just the latest in a long line of tyrannical conquerors. Dictators and despots were everywhere, and they used fear to enslave a population. But you know, it's also true that whenever dictators rise up, so does resistance. A little over 30 years after the birth of Jesus, Peter, the leader of a small band of disciples, openly defied the local authorities in Jerusalem by preaching in the name of Jesus. And in an effort to silence his offensive message, Peter and the other disciples were arrested and thrown into prison. But you know, after a miraculous release, Peter and the others were right back in the central courtyards preaching again. They were arrested, of course, and this time when challenged, Peter refused to be silenced. And instead, he boldly stated, Obedience to God comes before obedience to man. Obedience to God comes before obedience to man. Mm. The political elites of today like to think they are the ultimate authority. Have you noticed that? And they think that there is no other power greater than theirs, God included. Just look at the many ways these political elites have tried to ban Christmas by renaming it a winter holiday or some other inoffensive name. Did you know that back in 1656, Oliver Cromwell actually banned Christmas? He decreed that all markets and shops were to stay open on the 25th of December. And furthermore, Cromwell's soldiers were ordered to patrol the streets, seizing any food they found being prepared for Christmas celebrations. Hmm. Talk about a Christmas Grinch, eh? But you know what? When Cromwell died, so did his band. <laughs> Much more recently, Tony Blair tried to do it again, you know. In the wake of Alistair Campbell's infamous We Don't Do God statements, Tony Blair unsuccessfully tried to have Christmas renamed as Winter Festival. But the resistance was just too great, even for Tony Blair. But today it's not uncommon to hear the Merry Christmas slash Happy Holidays question hotly debated in many Western governments as the imperative for political correctness takes over rational thinking. You know, the French have a saying, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they remain the same. You know, for Christians, this is a special time of the year. It's a time when we celebrate the coming into our world of the one who saves us from all the fears of dictatorial oppression. And let's face it, he is the only one who can bring infinite and everlasting peace. As the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. So yes, times may well be changing and Dark clouds may well be gathering once again to threaten the freedom, peace, and stability of the world and make it a gloomy, less certain, and more fragile place. But I'm not going to let any of that stop me from celebrating Christmas. I'm part of the resistance, you see. And like the first Peter, I too am proud to proclaim obedience to God 
comes before obedience to man. So I won't let the despots and would-be dictators spoil my Christmas. And I trust, hope and pray you won't let them spoil yours either. A very happy Christmas to each and every one of you, and God bless you all.